Hello, my name is Gary Millett. This is topic number three of the first course introduction to IoT. Uh, the subtopic here is electronic control systems. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with this material. Uh, if you are trained as an electrical engineer or you're involved in electrical engineering technology or electronics technology, you're probably familiar with this, maybe even automation. Um, control system theory has been around for a long time, so let's take a closer look. So the classic control system block diagram is shown here. We have a controller block, an actuator, a process that we want to control. And uh, it turns out normally we take and we put in some type of set point. That is, we have a desired result. And of course, the system attempts to provide an output that's consistent with the setting of the input. And uh, a simple but fairly universal example, of this is the throttle or gas pedal of a modern automobile, or uh, say a heating thermostat in one's house or apartment. Again, <clears throat> you set the value that you want, and uh, say you want it to be you know, in the wintertime, 72 degrees in your apartment or house, you set it to 72 degrees, and hopefully the system will provide that heat to you. Now, if you're driving in a car and you want to go a certain speed, as actually you look at the speedometer, uh, it turns out you put your foot down on the gas pedal, or actually throttle control system now, and uh, it turns out that you will get to that speed as you after you accelerate or you can decrease your speed and so on. That would be a classic control system. And the actuator, as you can see here, is a mechanism. Uh, the process is some physical system. And our desired output is a uh, controlled variable and some measurable result. There's also a little arrow there. It's called disturbance. And that's anything that tends to uh, interfere with what's going on with the control system. So. Here's a little more detail about this. Uh, again, the set point, some desired result. Um, maybe a temperature, speed, pressure, voltage, current, height, flow rate, and so forth. Uh, but you might want to you know, expand your idea about this to uh, consider more complex control systems. And in that case, the set point could take on a more complex construct. Uh, it could be a machine or milled component, some automated process, uh, you know, an automatic pilot, autonomous, say, or driverless cars, autonomous machines, which are robots, pilotless drone, and so forth. So again, uh, you know, a simple control system uh, could be one thing, and a more complex control system could uh, provide something like, again, a driverless car. So if we take a little bit of a look at the controller in detail, the control is a device that monitors and physically alters the operating conditions of a given dynamic system. Now, historically, the controller typically used some form of mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic, or electronic means to implement its function. Today, it's commonplace to incorporate a computer or more often a microcontroller to perform this function. And of course, that begs the question, you know, microcontrollers now are single little IC chips and uh, their power has uh, increased dramatically uh, as to what they can do, uh, how much capacity they have, and so on. We've gone from 4-bit to 8-bit to 16-bit to now uh, very inexpensive 32-bit microcontrollers. And uh, there are many, many more microcontrollers sold uh, in the world than there are microprocessors. Microprocessors are devices that we use to make things like PCs. The actuator, the middle block here, is a type of motor, and a motor is a generic term here used for moving or controlling a mechanism or system. Now, you know, this motor typically could be a familiar electric motor, uh, and it could have associated mechanical gears and things like worm screws and so forth, uh, or some type of microelectromechanical or MEMS device, say used in a medical implant device. So. What's happened with the actuator is that it has become much more, uh, how should we say, uh, broadly based as far as what it's capable of doing. 
process, the last block in this diagram, is certainly the physical systems that's, that's being controlled. Uh, by the way, there are several different types of processes. There's what we call discrete, batch, continuous, and hybrid. And as I mentioned before, disturbance, anything that has influence upon the state of the physical system, uh, typically this is undesired and reduced as much as possible. You don't want anything disturbing uh, the process. Uh, however, since this is the real world, uh, things can disturb the process. Uh, if you think about setting the temperature of a thermostat, uh, obviously what the ambient outside temperature is, uh, is a disturbance so to speak, to that system. Uh, older heating systems, uh, if all of a sudden the cold snap came by, uh, you could have your house temperature set to 70 degrees, and all of a sudden it goes from, say, 40 degrees outside to zero. Uh, the heating system back in those days tended not to be able to keep up with uh, that type of sudden change in temperature. Uh, it turns out that uh, we might call that response, but uh, uh, today, we will have sensors that will try to take and reduce that, uh, you know, unable to be able to uh, catch up with what's going on outside. So we might sense that all of a sudden there's a, uh, a large change in temperature and build that into the system. Uh, the control variable is a measurable result of the physical process. We mentioned examples before, temperature, pressure, height, speed, position, voltage, current, flow rate laser output power, anything you could think of could be the control variable. And uh, more complex control systems such as a car, electronic fuel injection system, an EFI system, uh, they might provide efficiency, number of miles per gallon. Now, there's two types of classic control systems. What we show here in this three block system is what we call an open loop control system. And an open loop control system has no mechanism to check whether or not the control variable matches the set point. So, you know, we set the set point, but who knows what happens. Uh, examples of open loop systems would be the common street light that turns off and on with ambient light intensity. Uh, basically, there's a photo cell on the top of that street light that's outside on the street, and when the sun goes down, gets dark, uh, the photo cell detects that, and the street light comes on. In the morning when uh, the sun starts to rise, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, ambient light starts to occur, gets light outside, uh, dawn occurs, and uh, what happens? The photo cell uh, senses that and the light goes off. Of course, we've all probably driven our cars down roads and observed street lights that aren't on when it's dark or street lights that might be on when it is light outside. So again, uh, there's nothing to check the controlled variable for an open loop control system. The, the closed loop control system, however, now uses a sensor or sensors to take a look at the controlled variable. Uh, this is the more typical of today's type of control systems. And uh, you again use the sensor to measure the control variable to see whether or not it matches the set point value. So notice this is a feedback loop. And there's another block in there in the beginning called the comparator. And the comparator compares the set point to the feedback signal from the sensors. And uh, they are subtracted from one another according to that diagram. Set points plus and the uh, feedback's minus. And any error, that is any difference between those two values, is what's transmitted now to the controller. So most modern day control systems use this type of technology. For instance, a cooking oven or home heating or cooling system. Uh, if you take a look at most ovens, inside the oven there will be a uh, thermocouple, a type of uh, temperature sensor, and uh, you set the oven for whatever temperature, and when it's met, it turns out the electricity or the gas, uh, whatever is causing the uh, heat to occur, uh, is shut off. Uh, when something cools off, it turns out that uh, that thermocouple or sensor, temperature sensor, would indicate, oh, uh, now it's, say, too cold, we should turn that, uh, you know, electricity back on if it's electric stove, or the gas back on, say, it's a, if it's a gas stove. So uh, that is done through a sensor feedback comparator uh, type of operation here. We call this a closed loop control system. So uh, I think I've talked about this already. Uh, 
The error signal drives the controlled variable towards the set point. Now, what's happened over the course of time is that prior slide showed an analog control system. Now here we have a digital control system. And essentially what's happened is the digital control system uses D to A converters. We call them DACs. And A to D converters, we call them ADCs. Uh, so in these systems, the analog data from the sensors is transformed into digital data so it can be dealt with by a digital controller. So what is that digital controller? Typically a microcontroller, a microprocessor, or in some cases a full-blown computer. Uh, now the error is a binary value that's converted into an analog value by the DAC. Uh, today the ADC is often an integral part of the sensor. So what happens now is we have a set point and uh, you don't see a comparator here, but what happens is uh, the digital data coming back is compared versus the, you know, the set point has been digitized in that digital controller. Now, what about digital control systems and the Internet of Things? Well, recently what's happened is we've added a communication interface to our digital closed loop control systems. Take a look at the controller in the far left and you see the interface, which is a arrow with arrowheads on both ends indicating it can send out data as well as take data in. Uh, with this interface, we can now create cyber physical control systems that are enabled by the internet. So that interface possibly is a uh, network interface that uh, allows us to get onto the internet. What about electronic control systems and AI and ML? Well, it turns out the buzzwords recently have been artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So today, the emerging fields of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is actually a subdiscipline of artificial intelligence, open a whole new world of possibilities for electronic control systems um, that we could consider to be IoT applications. For today's control systems with a communications link to the outside world, Data is available that may be used to provide related knowledge that can be used to make predictions and subsequently make decisions. This type of operation is known as machine learning or again, ML. Why now? Well, again, the price of computing hardware continues to plummet. The associated amount of computing power per microprocessor IC keeps increasing and the amount of available data keeps increasing. You have to couple these facts with the advances in deep neural networks a great deal of research that's happened over the course of time in AI and ML, and the development of novel architectures and algorithms. And um, there today is a great deal of opti optimism about developing IoT-based electronic control systems that can learn and improve their performance. So uh, today you don't hear too much about uh, uh, the IoT and things like uh, uh, cyber physical systems without having the interjection of ML and AI uh, into that conversation. Uh, where that's going to go is a good question, but uh, people believe that we can take and, again, uh, with large data sets, extract information from those large data sets and use it to take and make uh, better decisions as to how we take and control things.